What if everyone were Barack Obama? OK, people have different ideas about the efficacy of his political career. And if everyone were literally the same person, the world would be a very boring place. But what I mean is, politics aside, what if everyone had the kinds of personal qualities that has made Obama so respected in his personal interactions? His maturity, his ability to stay calm under pressure, his patience. Really, just take a moment to imagine it. What would our workplace look like if we all had that level of cool? What would our friendships look like? What would our relationships look like? It's difficult to imagine because we don't really have any reference for what that would be like. But it's clear from what we can imagine that the world would be a dramatically different place. This idea that change towards the kind of standard set by Obama, that change in ourselves is what's needed for fundamental change on a broader scale, is nothing new. Gandhi wrote all the way back in 1913 that we but mirror the world. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. Since paraphrased into the popular quote, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. 75 years later, Michael Jackson had the same idea in Man in the Mirror. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. It's something we all know. But if it's so clear what kind of a difference internal change could make, and it's been clear for such a long time, then why do we spend so little time on it compared to external change? We build ourselves ever higher office buildings to give ourselves more space to work. We put in place systems to make sure we have equal opportunities for men and women in the workplace. And every so often we redecorate our homes. But what time do we spend on deliberate internal change? On deliberately developing those qualities we each hold as valuable? It's clear there's value on both sides, but assuming there's the same amount to gain from internal change as from external change, why do we spend a disproportionately small amount of time and energy on it? Well, I think the answer is actually not so mysterious. It's because internal change is really, really hard. Not just hard in the sense of something we have to put a lot of effort into, but hard in the sense of it's often not clear where to start. It's not just hard in the way that building a skyscraper takes hundreds of people in many years. It's hard like it was some 200 years ago, when we fundamentally didn't know how to build a skyscraper. With some stuff, we can say, oh, well, practice it. I'll practice being more patient. I'll practice reacting with more kindness. But saying these things is always a bit vague. What does that mean concretely? What are you actually going to do? What are the steps? It seems like the equivalent of saying, oh, building a skyscraper isn't so difficult. I'll just play around with some bricks until it stands up. Maybe you'll be able to muddle through and get somewhere, but it's going to be a slow process, if it works at all. What we need is something more like a methodology, some kind of a concrete procedure we can follow to get to where we want. Having had something of an engineering mindset since I was very small, both in interest and perhaps in temperament, this gap between our development of internal and external technologies is something I've been wondering about for a long time. Going to school and learning maths and physics and learning to program a computer, it was really satisfying being able to use these kinds of tools to build what I wanted. And in some way, it was also deeply satisfying seeing the kinds of problems we as a species had been able to overcome through the use of these tools. But then, I would still fight with my friends. I would still come home and argue with my mother. And I thought it was funny because these are the same problems we've been having for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why didn't we have tools for these kinds of problems too? But coming to university, I started reading a bit more, talking to people a bit more about this kind of stuff, and I realized there are actually people working on it. I mean, it's part of what the field of psychology is about, right? There's a whole research center at Berkeley, for example, the Greater Good Science Center, dedicated to exactly this kind of work. And it's not that it's not being publicized. People are making real efforts to get these things known about. There's uh, Carol Dweck at Stanford, for example, who's written extensively about her group's work on mindset. And Richard Wiseman at the University of Hertfordshire has written several very accessible books compiling all of this kind of research. But if we're saying that, clearly, what we need for internal change is methodology, and we have all these people working on such methodology, then why isn't awareness of these efforts more widespread? If we accept that internal change is something important, and we've known for such a long time, then why, when people are doing work, are we not more excited? 
Well, I think there are a couple of things going on here. The first thing is the mental categorizations we have of such material. Some of it we put under the heading of self-help, which automatically gives it the connotation that it's something you only go for if there's something wrong with you. Some of it we put under the heading of self-improvement, which seems to have some of the same kind of connotation to it. There's a certain way you should be, and this book is going to tell you how to get there. We don't have a category for just tools. You want to become more patient? All right, here's the set of steps you follow. You want to get better at empathy? All right, here's the practice to make that happen. There's no category for just a directory of different tools for different situations, like there is with, say, maths. So all of this stuff just gets lumped together as self-help and self-improvement, and we don't trust it. The second reason, though, is, I think, something more fundamental. We don't trust self-help or self-improvement because it doesn't seem to actually work. And there's a very complicated spectrum to this. At one end of the spectrum, there's the stuff which really is rubbish. Stuff which seems plausible, but that actual research has shown not to work at all, and in fact sometimes be actively harmful. The whole visualize yourself where you want to be thing, for example. Richard Wiseman cites studies where students asked to imagine themselves getting a grade A on that exam actually got worse grades than the rest of the group. At the other end of the spectrum, there's the stuff which really does contain something of value, but that doesn't seem to make a difference because it's ultimately not practiced. Theory is not enough for internal change. It does take some work to reshape mental habit. Then, somewhere in the middle, there's the stuff which is motivational and gives us a temporary boost. And don't get me wrong, there absolutely is a place for that if that's how it's sold. But that doesn't change anything long term. And so what we end up with from this whole spectrum is this impression of self, whatever, at best only working for some people, and at worst not working at all. It's left us jaded and distrustful of any of this kind of material. So, okay, the story so far is internal change is clearly something that would be useful. The problem is that we don't have ready access to methodology for internal change like we do for external change, and we're actively distrustful of efforts to create or disseminate such methodologies. But now, here's why I want to change your mind. So far we've talked a lot about high-level ideas and what-ifs, but what I want to prove to you is that this idea of methodologies is not fantasy, that not all of what we lump together as self-help and self-improvement is just sanctimonious rubbish. And I want to do that by giving you three examples of methodologies that I found useful in my life. One example for a broad change, one for a narrow change, and one for a more specific change. I want to make it absolutely clear, I'm not suggesting these as three changes I think everyone should make. These are just the things I've wanted to change in me. My first example, an example for a broad change, is meditation though a lot of the material about meditation is phrased in terms that I, as an engineer, find myself skeptical of, I've come to the conclusion that the underlying idea, the actual method, is actually very simple. You just watch. You watch your thoughts or you watch your breath, and you watch without getting involved in anything. You watch like the old guy who just sits at the bench in the park and watches everything go by. And when you notice you have got up off the bench to go and get some darn kids, you just gently sit back down and resume your watching. That's all you do. And the benefit, it turns out, is something very tangible. It's that being able to watch yourself without interpretation gives you the ability to step back from yourself. It allows you to realize, huh, I'm feeling angry, without getting caught up in what you're angry about, or to recognize that an anxious thought has gone by without dwelling on it. That's not to say it's not difficult. It is difficult. It is difficult in the way that building a skyscraper is hard, even when you know how to go about it. But the way to tackle that difficulty, what you actually do, is very concrete. You just sit down and watch. Your thoughts, your emotions say, telling yourself that you're going to watch with a sense of curiosity and acceptance. And sitting down to watch like this regularly, it does have a very definite effect. So, example number one of actual methodologies for internal change. Meditation. If the thing that you want to change is getting better at taking a step back from your emotions, the method is to sit down regularly and, with a sense of curiosity, just watch yourself. My second example 
comes from a method of communication called nonviolent communication, created by an American psychologist, Marshall Rosenberg, inspired but not directly related to Gandhi's ideas in nonviolence. One of the ideas in nonviolent communication is that what often prevents us from being able to empathize during conflict is moral judgment. As soon as we start thinking in terms of blame, our ability to put ourselves in the other person's shoes completely goes out the window. So, if the thing that you want to change is being able to stay empathetic in a broader range of situations, it's useful to reduce the amount of moral judgment going on inside your head. The way you do that is by shifting focus from what you perceive to be wrong with the other person to what's going on inside yourself. If we're judging someone as lazy, then perhaps it's because one of the things we really value is the ability to be productive. Or if we're annoyed with someone for not listening, then perhaps it's that what we're really needing is to be understood. And if we can shift focus like that, the sense of blame weakens. The method for making that shift is every time you notice yourself making a moral judgment of someone, you stop and ask yourself, what's going on inside me? What unmet need in me is this judgment reflective of? What value of mine is at the root of this judgment? You shift focus from blame of the other person to needs in yourself. And again, it is hard in building a skyscraper way. It takes time to weaken the associations between the emotions that precede judgment and the judgment itself. But asking yourself these questions consistently, those associations do shift. So that's example number two. If the thing that you want to change is being able to empathize even in difficult situations, watch out for moral judgments. And when you notice yourself making them, shift focus from fault in the other person to what the unmet need or unmet value is in yourself. The third and final example of methodological change I want to share is an example for much more specific change. The idea of leaning into the pain. This one comes from Aaron Swartz, one of the co-founders of the social media site Reddit. The idea with this one is, what often stops us doing the scary things that would expand our comfort zone are the associations we have with the feelings that come up. Those feelings of nervousness or fear, the associations we often have with them are something to back away from. There's this almost physical urge to retreat. But if what we want to do requires us to move outside of our comfort zone, we need to change the association we have with those feelings. So, the idea is, instead of associating those feelings with having gone too far, we reassociate them with having gone far enough. Far enough that we know we are expanding our comfort zone. You change the association from those feelings being something to back away from to something that tells you you're in the right place. Something to feel good about. As with the other two examples, there's a very definite method for this reassociation. You just watch out for that feeling of wanting to put something off because it's uncomfortable, and you deliberately lean into it. You deliberately think about it for a while, reminding yourself that the discomfort you're feeling is a good thing, because it's through this discomfort that you are expanding your comfort zone. You do this over and over again whenever you notice those feelings, and again, the association shifts, and these scary things become easier to handle. So these are my three examples. Meditation, nonviolent communication, and leaning into the pain. These examples prove that this idea of methods for deliberate internal change isn't just the stuff of dreams. Each of these examples has a very concrete set of steps and just as tangible results. If you are interested in any of these, then please go and read about them from the original authors or go and watch TED Talks on them. Other people have explained them far better than I can. I've deliberately glossed over a huge amount because it's not about these three things. The point is, these examples are proof that methods for deliberate internal change are out there. That not all of what we lump together as self-help and self-improvement is just ineffectual gibberish. So here's what I propose. We create a new category for ourselves. Self-change. And we look for stuff to put in it. Whenever we see something in, say, a TED Talk or a book that we think could help us go in the direction we want, we deliberately move it in our minds from self-help or self-improvement to self-change. 
even if it has the appearance of, or is phrased in terms of self-help and self-improvement, we look past that and just concentrate on the methodology proposed. And finally, for the things we collect in this category, we deliberately plan investment of time and energy in these methods of internal change, just as we do external change. Because think about it. What's one personal quality that you value and admire? What's one piece of internal change that's important to you? Consider how much difference that change could make, not only to your own well-being, but also to the world around you. I'm inviting us to imagine a future. A future with not only self-driving cars, the elimination of disease, and perhaps even the end of poverty, but a future where each of us are different. A future where everyone, say, responds to conflict as well as Obama does. A future where each of us do embody the qualities we each hold as valuable. And looking to that future, it's going to be investment of time and energy in these methodologies, in this systematic process of self-change that will take us there, that will take us from dabbling around with wooden stone to building skyscrapers, that will enable us to take a look at ourselves and make a change, to be the change we wish to see in the world. Thank you.